My name is Garth Knox and I'm one of the composers as part of this uh, 50 for the Future project organised by the Kronos Quartet at Carnegie Hall. And I'd like to say a few words about my quartet, which is called Satellites. And satellites obviously refers to those things that fly around our heads and change our lives. And I was thinking of some of the musical ideas I could use to illustrate thinking about these things. There are three parts to the piece. They can be played separately as separate movements, or they can be played together as one whole. So let me talk about them one by one. The first part is called geostationary. And this one, I think of those satellites that hover, hover over our heads in the same place. Now, actually, the interesting thing about these is they're actually hurtling through space at an enormous speed. But because we're hurtling through space at the same enormous speed, they seem to be stationary to us. And this idea of something that's moving and getting nowhere interested me greatly. I thought a musical idea for this would be the little motor items that go round and round and round, but actually don't get anywhere. That's why all these pizzicato things are there. Because there's so much pizzicato in this movement, I thought it was worth mentioning a couple of things about it. Um, the pizzicato, I like to think of it doing it with two fingers. You normally do it with just one, but this, I think, should be done with two. So the, the first finger would be on the lower string second finger on the higher string makes it easier and faster and very easy to articulate like walking first one then the other and it may feel difficult at first but you know this this this, this is just something you learn when you think what your left hand can do with all the fingers it's very simple to do two fingers with the bits together and for the left hand there's a hammer on so to isolate the moon in that finger I find it easier to have fingers down already. And then you, you pull off. And it's not enough to lift the finger. You have to pull to the... So. Because for me, a slur means the first note is plucked by the right hand, and everything else under that slur is handled by the left hand. So the beginning is... And the pizzas at the beginning can be very dry, but they stop. Because you have the choice you can do, or you can do. And at the beginning, this is what I want. These kind of things, really dry. Yeah? And um, the other thing about pizzicatos is there are many colors you can use with the pizzicato. Um, like you would with the bow, coming nearer or further away from the bridge. And at the beginning, it's nice to be quite near the bridge. You can also affect it what you use, how fleshy the finger you use is. You can do it with a nail, like the cello does. Or you can do it with a very flat. And I'd like all those colors to be used kind of at will throughout the piece, just playing around with this idea that pizzicato can be a really interesting thing in itself. So for the first violin, um, you have some quite, some quite fancy pizzicatos, and actually there's a place where we've got into this kind of stationary orbit, and suddenly this asteroid shower comes sparkling through, and this is where the first violin is. This is bar 31. So you want that e, that's going to ring a lot, and this, I think it's, I think the rolling of this is, and the coming back is just a little flake. It can be the same finger, or you can do or you can change fingers as you like, but this and the other one's the same. So we hear this. So staying quite close to the string, get this really brittle sound is nice. At the end, at letter H, there's this kind of. So it's down, up, left hand, down, up, left hand, down, up, left hand. preparation for the, for the next chord. All this kind of, you can have fun with this, it can be quite for free, but it's nice to find out a good rhythm to do this in. For the second violin, um, you have a lot of this. And again, I would say two fingers is twice as fast as one.
And there's, there's what might look a confusing part for the second violin at, uh, let, uh, just after F. But if you take it, break it down and see how it looks, there's a chord on, every, on the first beat. Two, three, and then. And those, it's repeated every two bars. You just add to that. So like for the first line, you take it off. So one, two, three. And all that's added between is a slide. And then the right hand fills in. So it's loud, quiet. It's complicated to write down, but it should be easy. <laughs> For the viola, at letter D, you have this fun little thing, the four-finger pizzicato, and that's like, as its name suggests, it's a four-finger pizzicato, like this on a chord. And it's nice, it's very short to begin with, so you can play a little bit near the bridge. You can also pick up the left hand when you pick up the right hand, so instead of leaving, instead of leaving it, that's coming later, but first. Progressive thing, start very small, very controlled, and lifting up both hands, and then little by little it gets longer and louder and more adjusted, and then you can drop the, the four fingers and go into the normal finger. So that's, it's up to you to choose the moment you do that, but it's, it's supposed to be starting like that and finishing like that. So that's the fun for the viola player. For the cello, I think sliding on the pizzicato sounds very good, so I put quite a lot in, and the things like at the beginning. a bit of a nail pizzico. And the sliding technique in the left hand, I find it helpful to put down a finger on the G string while you're doing this. Because the pull-off becomes easy. And then it gives you a finger to damp the C. That kind of thing. Then you have a series of these rows, these, this. And again, I think a finger on the adjacent string Things that you can actually do the kind of crescendo. It has to fall off the string. It doesn't really matter how far you go, it's just a general guide that high enough to show you how far to go. And then there's the, 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 the looping pizzicato, and this is the really idea of geostationary. It's something that slides and goes nowhere. So it's hard to explain, but very easy to, to copy. You can see this is like this. Start small, get the hang of it to the left, it's one normal pizzicato, then you place the finger of the right hand where the left hand was, and pits with the other finger, then you, you can have fun, go further. And again, I think it's very helpful to have, keep a finger on the adjacent string because it makes it easier to pluck. And at the end of the piece, there's a series of them so you can get louder like this. And the very end of the piece. The second movement of satellites is called a spectral sunrise. And the sunrise part is inspired by hearing an astronaut speaking on the radio about being in this International Space Station and how the sun would come up every 90 minutes up there. And he said he never got over the wonder of the light coming, this intense, intense light, and then disappearing again. He said it was the most moving thing of his day. It happened 16 times a day. So this piece lasts uh, four minutes. I think there are three sunrises in there. So they're pretty fast sunrises. And they're called spectral sunrises because what I wanted to explore was, were some ideas linked to what they call spectral music. Now, spectral music has always been there. In fact, the music of the spheres is spectral music. And no one thought of a name for it until the 1970s. And with computers, we can take these, these spectral ideas um, much, much farther. But what it is, to put it very basically, if you think of white light, um, is just white light. And when it goes through a prism, which is anything that makes it turn a corner, um, that splits it, like runners on a, on a racetrack. The guy's around the corner, the guy on the inside track, he gets, he's, he has a shorter track, and so he comes out first. And the light particles come out in, this, in the rainbow, basically. When the sun hits the raindrop, 
There we have this beautiful spectrum of light. And a note is the same thing. What in spectrum is the idea a note is not a note. We know a note on a violin is on a violin because of its color of the note. You know, it's not the same as hearing a note on an oboe or on a piano. Because, very simply, a note is not a note, it's a sound. It's a collection of notes, a whole bunch of harmonics which are swirling together and creating that one sound. So the idea of spectral music is to make that obvious, to listen to the, the note as a sound. So the first sunrise happens on the note D. I'm not really a cellist, excuse me. Which is the big, rich note. In fact, you know, in the Latin languages, it's called the re, which means king. It's the king of the notes, like uh, Louis XIV in Basai. It's the note that, re, that shines out of So the big cello solo, because it is a cello solo at the beginning, <laughs> It's just this, this, this note, but we listen to it as a sound now. Then going away from it. closer. And even closer. And suddenly... And all these little debris were in there all the time. You're hearing. When you look inside the note, that's what you find. All the stardust. So while the cello is doing this big royal note, which is shining out like a big sunrise, the others are showing what's inside that note, the violin. This is the viola, but the first violin is doing this. Showing all the harmonics of D. So it's not a slide in this sense, it's a slide in this. And the A string plays too. And what's nice is this can be quite irregular and it can come and go like waves, like natural pulses. Like and even bearing this bow from one string to the other. like an improvisation on these, these inner harmonics. The middle two, at the same time, are doing what we call this trembling harmonics. Now, trembling harmonics is like a normal harmonic, but, which is already very nice, but we add two things to it. One is this up and, it's sort of vertical vibrato. So the left hand does this up and down movement, very gentle. So the pitch doesn't change, but it comes and goes. And this again should be irregular, should come and go like waves. Give me Ponticello. And you can think of adding this white bow noise to it. You cover this. Like the waves of the sea, so like this. And the second violin joy. And between them, they fill out all these harmonics of the first violin going up and down, and the bottom is underneath in the cello. So it's a sunrise in the sense of it's one note, what we used to call one note, which we're now calling one sound, that runs up and down and shines out like a magic thing, completely quite loud. Going back to the cello, when we get up to the top of the range here, you can hear that up to there or so, the notes are we're quite familiar with. It sounds like a D major kind of chord. It's a normal note you'd find on the piano. Apart from here, we get the notes of the scale. But some are tuned like the piano tuning, and some are way off, like this one. Which sounds very nice. It's actually a quarter tone high. So each of the two solos for viola and violin play with this idea of playing the normal note in the spectral tuning. So when the viola has his little solo, he plays the notes the cello played, but instead of playing a, he plays the spectrum. With practice. You 
come to hear it as the natural tuning, which is in the D note already. The harmonic is a very satisfying note. It's not an out of tune note. It's the most in tune note in the scale when you play it properly. So that's the idea of those quarter tones, which are both solos. Same for the violin, although we moved up to the, to the A string by then. The three sunrises, the first one is on D, second one is on A, and the third one is on E. So it's very simple, like a, a Baroque piece, you know, with three, three chords, basically. It moves through. The other notable feature of the little cadenzas, on, the, on all three cadenzas this time, for viola, violin, and cello, is this thing called multiphonics. And my idea here was to break through the sound barrier and find what's on the other side. If you find a fragile point in the string, like on the viola, the F sharp, and you play it very ponticello, and then you start trembling. And the sound kind of breaks up. And you start finding these wonderful little things in. By varying the speed, you can find very, very many different things in there. And it's very nice, it's free, each time it happens is a bit different. When you split the note, you don't, it's like when you split the atom, you're not sure what's going to come out and what direction it's going to go. So it's a moment where the note splits, we go into another world, and it's followed by a short cadenza for the person who did the multiphonic. And the idea of this is complete blackness, the sun has gone away, but just a few molecules are left, and a little flash of light every now and again comes back. So the player can play anything they like, it's just slow and quiet and spaced out. As it should be a kind of magical moment of the performance where suddenly we're listening to the important things. We're listening to almost nothing. And the very few things there are become very important because there's so few of them. So that's the other cadences. Uh, the one thing which isn't a sunrise is the spectral spacewalk, <laughs> which is just a funny little thing. I felt sorry for the second violin, which has no cadenza. I thought the movement was too short to have four cadenzas, but I wanted the second violin to have something to play. And so they go, he goes for a spacewalk, and the spacewalk is trying to stay in a straight line. So we have the first violin on this constant G, showing him where the horizon is. The cello is gradually falling back to earth, semitone by semitone. Uh, the viola is just sarcastically commenting on it. And the second violin is trying to walk in this straight line with his two legs sort of spreading apart, the two notes getting farther and farther apart. And it can be very comical, it should be pulled around in time and have fun with it. And then it's for the second violin, this is your moment. The third moment of uh, satellites is called dimensions. And in space, as you know, there's many dimensions. And when you're playing a string instrument, there's many dimensions too. And I wanted to explore some of them. Uh, some places we don't often go, others places very familiar. So it's a series of um, different ways of using the bow, basically. The bow is showing us which dimension we're moving in. At the beginning, there's the up-down vertical dimension. So the bow is moving only in this direction. So we're not going to do very much of this. This is all bouncing. So it's and what's interesting is the kind of tack you get. So it can, you can be very short and sharp, or you can pull it a little and get that, that little sound, which is very nice. So at the beginning, it'd be a simple like, And you want to get the bow to bounce on its own, which means leave it alone. Take your fingers off as much as you can. And we have things like pizzicato at the same time as playing. This kind of thing. Various, everyone has all these vertical things. The only thing that isn't is the first violin goes every now and again. Everything else is this dimension. The cello, when they start, comes in with a kind of percussion effect, which can be on the tailpiece, on the strings, or anywhere you feel comfortable with. I wouldn't want anyone to do anything to their instrument they don't want to do. And speaking of the bow, if for this movement you'd rather take a, a carbon fiber bow or another bow, that's absolutely fine. I wouldn't use an old Italian bow with this. I use my normal bow, generally. This is a carbon fiber bow. In a way, it's in better because you can do what you like with it and they're very fast and light. But any kind of normal type bow will, will be good. Just don't take any risks you wouldn't like to take. <laughs> and when we finish the vertical dimension, we go very surprisingly into the sideways dimension, the horizontal dimension. And this is a dimension we don't normally use. And the idea is it's, it's a very visual effect in this piece because we're doing this for a few minutes and suddenly this comes. <laughs> This stroke is moving down the string 
in the center of the string and back up again. And it works best when you do it this time, you swing this wrist strand, the, the fingers round, so you're swaying the bow from one, like this. You can hear you get much less note, but you get a very nice sweeping sound, which some people call the windscreen wiper. First time it comes, it's very important to freeze after it. It's called psychoacoustics. When you see something, you hear it. So, so if, if you do this, we don't hear it so much. If you do this, then we hear it. And then two. And when it gets going, and you can choose how much pitch can be in it. It doesn't have to be much. It's nice visually when people move the same way. So the viola and cello should do the same, either this way or that way together. The violin's the same, this way together. So you just have to decide which way the arrow means to you, this way or that way. The next dimension is a circular dimension, which is a bit like the sideways one, but we add in a bit of this movement. So we're now, so essentially it's this kind of effect. So the bow is very light, take all the weight off the bow. If you're very free in this hand, allow the bow to do this little movement inside the hand. And it's very nice, the sort of cross-phasing you get when you do it. It's very nice to everyone playing the same rhythm, but these different rhythms coming out. So, we've, so you have to show very clear to, your, to yourself and the others what rhythm you're thinking. comes out will not necessarily be what you're doing, which is the nice part of it. The next dimension is to turn the bow the other way. So you're using two sides of the bow, the right side, where the hair is, and the wrong side, where the wood is, and change it between them. So when it starts, it can be... I didn't know how to write down this traveling motion, but I think it's rather nice to go... Because then you can come back, give it out. So you get a fun traveling up and down the string with this. And then there's this alternating the sides of the bow, which is a little flick here in the right hand, which is very useful to learn for going. You now doubled the possibilities of your bow. The next one is a little more unorthodox. It's called the whip. And you easily see why this is a demonstration of the whip. Here it comes. So it sounds like a whip, it looks like a whip, and it is a whip. This is the downwards whip, and this is the upwards whip. Again, it's a very visual effect, so we're playing along and suddenly. I think you have to assume the visi visibility of it and really do a big gesture. Again, psychoacoustic, when we see it, we hear it. And the last effect I want to explain is called the helicopter. So the idea is obviously is to sound like a helicopter with the braids going And how we do this is a little like the circular one, but instead of doing it here, we want to come up here. So this noise becomes part of the sound. For this, I find it useful to hold the bow in a more primitive way. Just grab it, like it was a piece of wood with some hair on it, which it is. And then you... And you have to judge how much weight you can take and how much pitch you want. So it can be a weighty thing, and the, again, it's the which really counts. And the end of the piece, as you've seen, is is a, can a free for all on this. Any rhythm you like, which dies away, and then. Okay, for this piece, I must say um, I learned a lot by writing this piece, and I had a lot of fun playing this piece. And I would like to think that you too will learn something from playing this piece, not just for this piece, but for other things. But I hope, it's above all, that you have a lot of fun with it. So enjoy. <laughs>